Let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel uh, chapter 38. And uh, we'll be looking at chapter 38 tonight. Actually, uh, chapters 38 and 39 really make one section, but we're going to divide it into two sections so we can develop thoroughly as, thoroughly as is possible our teaching related to um, this coming invasion that we see here in Ezekiel chapter 38. So let's begin reading in Ezekiel chapter 38 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel 38, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma, from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your, compa your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. As I mentioned a moment ago, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 actually work together they make up a, a, a single unit, and, a, and they contain a, a prophecy, a prophecy that, that concerns a, a future invasion of the nation of Israel. And uh, what we see here is, is Ezekiel writing prophet, prophetically for the future, especially dealing with the future restoration of the nation. As we consider this, it's interesting to me, and as I was preparing this study, I, I took special care to look as closely as I could within the context and time that I have to be able to prepare studies such as this. I, I, I took some time to look at the various names that we see represented here, and I find it interesting to note that these names, though written during the time of Ezekiel, actually have a significant uh, reality for us today in the 21st century. When you start considering the nation of Israel today, and you start beginning to think concerning her allies, who are the allies of Israel? When you consider that and you look at this particular nation, the nation of Israel, you ask yourself, are there any nations that are allied with her? We know that there are some nations that, that have uh, given their, their help to her in the past and, and perhaps may even be counted on in the present and into the future. We know that India and, and Canada uh, are allies. We know that the United Kingdom are allies. We also know that Germany has been an ally to Israel in the recent past. Obviously, the greatest ally that Israel has is the United States. And the United States, combined with uh, Great Britain, has uh, provided much help in, in recent years. But she also has great enemies. And uh, it's interesting to note that the greatest enemy, I think, she, that she has outside of her herself, the greatest enemies to the nation of Israel, uh, include uh, Persia, which is modern Iran. But they also include a variety of Muslim countries, and Libya comes to mind. And so what you see here is you see really today's newspaper being written in the time of Ezekiel. Because what you see are nations that are being referred to here in this particular portion of Scripture that, uh, that are enemies of the nation of Israel to this day. Now, we need to remember that at the time of the writing, Israel has been overwhelmed and... and and her people, her children, are now being held captive in, in Babylon. And the captives who are there in exile have lost hope. We, we saw this in chapter 37, verses 11 and 12, when it said, The Son of Man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. So they had lost hope. They're in exile. And so the Lord begins to bring a word to them. And the word that God gives him is a prophetic word. Now, very often in Scripture, there are dual, dual 
meanings in the prophecies because God will give prophecies that relate to the near as well as the distant future. And in this particular case, in the case of Israel and in, case, in the case of her being returned from exile, it actually has two basic applications. One is for the near, near future. They're going to be brought back to the land. Now, while they're there in Babylon, they're undergoing great stress, and, and, and many of them are, are being uh, grieved tremendously because their faith that they have, the faith of Israel, has been mocked by their, by their captives. And so the psalmist in Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, actually wrote concerning this. He, he said, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And so they're in exile in Babylon. They're in need of comfort. They're in need of help. And so God gives them a word. You see, they could easily believe that God had given up on them, but God had not. Actually, God was chastening them in order that he might be able to prepare them for what he had for them. And, and God does bring chastening. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father the son in whom he delights. And so they're undergoing a chastening, and God is bringing a purging, and he's doing a work in them, and he's going to bring them out of exile. Uh, Jeremiah, who was a contemporary of Ezekiel, wrote concerning this in Jeremiah 29, and it refers to his, his completion of a, of a promise that he, that he was making that was going to be not that distant in the future. It was a near prophecy, because in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, it says, Thus says the Lord, After seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to a place from which I cause you to, to be carried away uh, uh, captive." And so the Lord is saying, you have been carried away, but I'll bring you home. And God says, I'm going to give you a future, and I'm going to give you hope. These people who are there in Babylon saying, they're mocking us. They're saying, sing us a song of Zion, because the Jewish songs had a lot of, uh, a lot of joy to them. They're saying, sing us songs of, of, of enjoyment and all mocking us. How can we do that? How can we sing in a foreign land? Well, God is saying, you're not going to be there that long. Seventy years, and I'm going to bring you back. So when you look at that, on the one hand, God is going to bring them back after their Babylonian captivity. But when we look at chapter 38, he's dealing with the yet future, a distant future. And that's what we're looking at today. This is a, a, a prophecy of a future invasion of the nation of Israel. Now, when you look at the first seven verses, even as we just read them, you're going to see that various nations are mentioned. And I'm going to give you some background, a little, little information to develop this because you need the information in order to get what he's saying here in chapter 38 and into chapter 39. Because you have a list of various nations that we've just gone through. Notice with me as he begins, he speaks of Gog, of the land of Magog. Now, Gog is, is actually a title. It, it means supreme or high one. And he's, he's the one who is over the land that is called Magog. When you look up Magog, you see Magog in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. He was a son of J Japheth. And, and where he went to, where he went and began to live and populated is uh, Central Asia. It is now regarded as being part of Southern Russia. And I want you to start thinking of these lands that I'm mentioning to you. It's part of ancient Russia, Southern Russia. And uh, that's the present home of of uh, such tongue twisters as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Chinostan, Ontario Stan, Afghanistan may be part of it. And so you're looking at a map and you're seeing southern Russia 
and these various uh, countries that now exist there. You have Rosh. Rosh can be translated as chief, but there are many contemporary as well as older scholars who believe that, that Rosh is, uh, is Russia. Uh, part of the reason is found in verse 6 and also in verse 15 because it refers to it as being of the far north, which could be Russia. You have Meshech and Tabal. Now, Meshech and Tabal were also sons of Noah, Noah's sons Japheth. Today, they would be in modern Turkey, southern Russia, northern Iran. You have Persia. Now, interestingly enough, Persia was called Persia until 1935. And in 1935, it changed its name to Iran. In 1979, it became the Islamic Republic of Iran. Obviously, Iran is an arch enemy of the nation of Israel as well as the West and actively works to cause other Arab nations to no longer cooperate with the United States, Israel, or any of our allies. You have Kush, and you have Put, Gomer, and Tagarma. Now, Kush is Ethiopia, but this is a portion of Ethiopia that's just south of Egypt on the Nile. Today, the land is occupied by Sudan, and Sudan is the home of the National Islamic Front. They are strong supporters of Osama bin Laden, where he lived from 1991 to 1996. You have Put. Put is modern Libya, and Libya openly refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. You have a place called Gomer. Gomer originally was in ancient southern Russia and is in modern Turkey in an area that we know as Armenia. Togarma is modern Turkey. And so there are reasons why I wanted to take the time to mention all of this to you, and I want you to see this. What you have here described as taking place in the latter days is a coalition of nations that hate the nation of Israel. When you look at the coalition of nations, you note by just looking at the ancient designations and seeing the geographic locations as to where they existed, you discover what they are is they're actually nations that have a, a, a very large or are a majority of Muslims in population. These nations have a Muslim majority. Four of the nations that were mentioned are in modern Turkey, Meshach, Tubal, Gomar, and Tagarma. And so somebody was writing that this makes a pretty strong argument for Turkey being part of the invasion of Israel. Current circumstances in that country also lend this view some credibility. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Turkey has been gaining inroads into Central Asia, Magog. It is also linked to Central Asia both ethnically and linguistically and has a growing number of political parties that support opposition to Israel, the establishment of a Turkish Islamic Republic, and the worldwide rule of Islam. Now, as you're looking at this, it includes portions of Russia. And I have to be honest with you, when I, when I first got saved and began to hear studies related to the last days and began to hear people speaking concerning Ezekiel 38 and 39, one of the things that I had is a question. It was, how can you even think that, that Russia could be part of something like this, that Muslims would actually ally somehow with Russia? Because during all of my lifetime, Russia was basically USSR, which was based on, on, um, on atheism. And so how can you have a union of any sort between an avowed atheistic government and radical Islam. How is that possible? Well, interestingly, Islam is currently the second most widely professed religion in the Russian Federation. According to the most recent estimates, while there are six million genuine followers of Islam in Russia, there are more than 20 million officially self-identified Muslims. There are a large portion of the population. There's a good segment of that population that professes to be Muslim. And so what you have here, and, and the way I'm approaching this quite obviously, is there is a coming invasion, yet future to us, that is going to be oriented towards the destruction of Israel. We're seeing that in chapter 38. We'll see that in some detail in just a moment. 
and that this is going to be a confederation of Muslim states, it fits right into what we have today. It fits right into the call for many who are saying that they want the nation of Israel to be obliterated. And so this is what was written concerning this particular future event. And what I find interesting is the lands that are, that are denoted as being in opposition and, and are bent on the destruction of Israel are lands that were, as of yet, not even Muslim lands. I mean, Islam didn't even begin to exist until the seventh century. And so what you have is you have this incredible future prophecy related to a group, a coalition of nations that have one thing in common, and that is that they're Muslim. And here we are in the 21st century, and you have people who are making uh, statements, and I'll show you one in just a moment, uh, that the nation of Israel has no right to exist, and, and it fits right into the prophetic picture here of the book of Ezekiel. Now, as we look at it, I want you to see that, that the Lord God is speaking. He says in verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tabal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. So this coalition's invasion against Israel is regarded as an attack, but I want you to see that he says, I am against you because this is an attack not just on the nation of Israel. It's regarded as an attack on God. And this is going to make the conflict between them and God. And God is saying, I'm going to defend the nation of Israel. The huge odds against Israel are going to be nullified because God is on their side. That's how they're going to be able to survive this attack. The psalmist in Psalm 56, verse 11 says, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And so God is saying, I am taking this personally. Your attack on Israel is really an attack on me. So he says in verse 4, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. He's saying, I'm going to treat you like an animal that has been caught. And you, as invaders, will not succeed in your plans. I'm going to let you enter into the nation of Israel because as you enter into the nation of Israel, that will put you in the position where I can visit you with judgment. Notice how they come. They come fully confident and fully armed, and they come prepared to conquer the nation of Israel. It's interesting in verse 7 how it, he says, Gog is, is to guard his troops. The point is, is that Gog is told to guard, be the guard for his troops because he's going to be helpless, because he's going to be defeated. Because in Isaiah 52, 12, God promises Israel that he will be their rear guard. So he's basically saying, Gog, you are supposed to be the one who defends them. When in reality, you are too weak to do so. As you enter in and as you attack my nation and as you come with intent to destroy, I'm going to be the rear guard of Israel and you are not going to have success. Now he says in verse 8, After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. And so this is going to take place, he's saying, in the latter years, in the last days. This is not something that's going to take place in the near future. And so in the context of Israel's restoration to the land, this is going to occur when she is once again a nation. And this would have to be, because it's a latter-day prophecy, it would have to be something that we today have the possibility of seeing, at least in our lifetime, begin to be fulfilled. Now he says in verse 9, You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. 
you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? And so the coalition that invades Israel intends to destroy as well as to plunder the nation. Now, verse 12 says this is a people gathered from all the nations. So that tells us that this is, this is something that's taking place in the latter time when the, when the nations have, have basically uh, seen Israel leaving in order to return to her home. It takes place in the latter days. And notice it occurs when they're living in a time of security. There's no fear in them at this time. There's no fear of deportation or anything else. And so when you look at this, this is something, an event that's going to be taking place, and by the way, this is one of those areas that good commentators differ, uh, that's going to be taking place in a period of time that is called uh, the tribulation in the last days. Now, I want you to notice that they are living in peace. They're in, uh, in, in villages that are unwalled. In, in the Old Testament, unwalled villages uh, is a picture of living with security. If you live behind a wall, it's because you have to have a defense against invasion. But when you live in an unwalled village, it's another way of saying you're living in peace and you're living in security. And so there's a security in them at this time, a peacefulness that they have. The question has to be asked, how is Israel going to have a time of peace? Now, if it's taking place in the last days, which it is, then it's not a difficult thing for us to begin to ask ourselves what kinds of conditions are going to exist that would make it possible for them to have peace. And the bottom line is, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, it seems to indicate that the way that they're going to have peace is they're going to be signing a covenant with a world ruler at that time whom we refer to most commonly as the Antichrist. Because in Daniel, in chapter 9, verse 27, it says that uh, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And those who study prophecy will point out that this is in reference to the Antichrist who is going to make a covenant of peace with the nation of Israel. When you study Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that contains what is called Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And those who have studied that know that it relates to 69 weeks that have already been fulfilled and a 70th week that is yet distant in the future. That is regarded by Bible scholars as being the prophetic period that is referred to in Scripture as the tribulation, a seven-year period of time that takes place in the last days when God is pouring out His wrath on an unbelieving world. In that period called the tribulation, which begins after the rapture of the church, I believe, you have a seven-year period in that seven-year period, you have an Antichrist, the coming world ruler, who's going to sign a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. There are going to be a variety of things that he allows them to do, and we believe very strongly that one of the things that he's going to allow them to do is to rebuild the temple. When you go to Israel to this day, they have what is called the Temple Institute. They already have a variety of things prepared for, for the um, rebuilt temple. They already have it. We actually have gone in many times and seen the, the various... Uh, implements that they have for sacrifice. We've, we've seen a variety of things that they have there in preparation for when they rebuild the temple. There is an intent on, on some very strongly Orthodox Jews. There's an intent within their heart to rebuild the temple as soon as it's possible. And so there's going to ultimately be something done. It's going to occur through the Antichrist. A treaty is going to be struck. I believe very strongly that what's going to happen is he's going to uh, uh, make a way for them to be able to rebuild the temple in the same site that it originally was, which is there on, the, on that mount there. And off to the distance, you're going to have the, the Dome of the Rock, and then you're going to also be able to coexist by having the, uh, the temple rebuilt. And, and so the nation of Israel is going to be able to rebuild their temple. When they rebuild their temple, they're going to have a, a time of pseudo-peace. And, and because the first three and a half years of the tribulation period are called simply tribulation. 
There's going to be an escalation that takes place, and you can see this by studying the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 18. And you're going to see that there's going to be a period of escalation. So over the first three and a half years, it's not going to be perfect peace, but the Israel, the Jews, will be living in a state of peace. So there are Bible commentators who believe that what's going to take place is going to take place somewhere between the seven-year period called the tribulation. Some say it begins, this Ezekiel 38, 39, could be at the beginning. Others say that it could be in the middle. And yet other fine scholars say that it could be at the conclusion. It will take place, though, it seems apparent, during that period of time. More than likely within the first three and a half years because the nation of Israel is living at peace during this time in, in a place called unwalled villages. Because in the second three and a half years, Jesus said, then you shall have great tribulation. And at that time, uh, all hell literally does break loose on that nation. And Zechariah makes it clear that two-thirds of the nation of Israel is destroyed. So up to that point, there's going to be a time of peace, and it's that time somewhere, more than likely within the first three-and-a-half-year period of the tribulation, that an invasion takes place through this particular leader. Now, this is going to be what many are calling a jihad. Now, what is it that's going to motivate this jihad? Well, there's a desire to possess Israel. It made it clear they want the land and all that the land has. They want its silver. They want its gold. They want the livestock. They want the goods. They want to wipe them off the face of the earth. And they want to take all that the nation of Israel has. Now, here's something for you that you may not know. Some of you may. Muslims believe it's part of their, their faith. Muslims believe that any land once occupied by Muslims belongs permanently to them. Any land that Muslims lived in belongs permanently to them. It's always theirs. That would include great portions of Europe because the Muslim invasion as they crossed into Europe made it all the way into France. And if Charles Martel had not defeated them at the Battle of Tours, They'd have gone beyond that into Britain and taken as much as they could. There are still huge populations of Muslims throughout Europe. You can go into Spain, and uh, there's a region there that I've been to. It's called Granada. And you can go there, and they have what is called the Alhambra. That's where we get the name Alhambra from out here for the city of Alhambra, the Alhambra there. Granada was heavily populated by Muslims, and to this day, it's a large population of Muslims in Spain. They populated various regions all the way into France, and to this day, there are a large population of Muslims in France. And according to Muslim philosophy, any land that they once occupied remains theirs forever. And so that is something that is accepted by almost every Islamic nation in the Middle East. That's why... That's why... There are many Muslim nations who will say that the nation of Israel has no right to exist. That's why they say that. Because Muslims lived in the land for so long, they say it cannot possibly belong to Israel. It belongs to us. And that's why there's such a great problem. Now, there's a president of Iran. His name is Ahmadinejad. Somebody says, I'm a nut job. No, Ahmadinejad. And... He called for, for Israel to be wiped off the map in a, a, a conference that was called A World Without Zionism. In, and this took place in Asia back in October of 2005. He believes that Israel has no right to exist. We know this. I'm just telling you things you already know. He doesn't believe they have a right to exist, and many other Muslim nations agree with him that Israel has no right to exist. And so they believe that they're only going to regain what, in fact, actually belongs to them. And that's why they want to go in, and that's why they want to plunder, and that's why they want to take, because they believe it, in, in, in reality, is theirs. Now, notice in verse 13 how it says, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold? to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder. Now, 
Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish. Sheba and Dedan are easy to identify because it represents uh, the area of Saudi Arabia. Tarshish is a little more difficult, but a large segment of conservative scholars believe that Tarshish represents Spain, ancient Spain. It's most likely ancient Spain, and it represents Western Europe. And so what he's speaking about here is Saudi Arabia and the merchants of Tarshish, which could include uh, Europe or Western Europe as is, are going to actually have a, what would be called a, a lame protest. They're not going to have a great fierce resistance. They're not going to be saying, this is wrong, you ought not to do it. They're simply going to ask the question, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? They're not going to do anything to mount any opposition at all as this begins to take place. Have you come to destroy Israel is what they're going to ask, but it's going to be one of these reserved responses. I could see that as being very, very possible where the world begins to shrink away from supporting the nation of Israel and leaving the nation of Israel apparently without defense. Of course, God is saying, I'm going to be the one who's defending you and you're not going to need these people. Well, look what he says in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. You're going to come out of the north. That's why many are saying the far north would say that this would have to represent Russia. You're going to come as a cloud, but I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to allow you to act on what is already in your heart, and I'm going to use it against you. And after I have destroyed you, the, the nations are going to see the power and the holiness of God. That's what he's saying in verse 17. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? My prophets have declared that I was going to set up a kingdom, and my prophets have declared that I was going to destroy their enemies, and you're going to be one of those whom I destroy, and it's going to, it's going to show the world that, that Israel's God is the true God. They're going to see how holy and how powerful I am. In the Psalms, in Psalm 2, verses 1 through 4, the question is asked, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And so God is saying, I'm going to allow you to come in because I'm going to show my power as I destroy you. I'm going to allow you to do what is in your heart and you're going to reap the consequences for doing so. In verse 18, it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. God says, I'm going to reveal my anger. My patience is finally exhausted. I am going to destroy Israel's enemies. Now it's interesting how he says, and I'm going to use uh, nature. I'm going to use a massive earthquake. When the earthquake hits, the armies, due to this incredible shaking of the world, 
shaking of the nation. The armies are going to spiral into confusion. And due to the earthquake, there's going to be pestilence and there's going to be anarchy. God is saying, I'm going to use nature against you, rain and hailstones, fire and brimstone. And as this takes place and the nations see this, they're going to realize that there's only one God and only one true God. And so this is going to take place in the near future. This is something that we're seeing shape up even right now. There is going to be an Islamic invasion. The countries that are related here are nations that are basically given over to the Muslim belief. The one question I had for a long time that has recently been answered was how could Russia be involved in such a thing? Should Russia be involved? And the answer is Russia can be involved because the southern portion of Russia is filled with those who are devoted Muslims. There is a great revival taking place throughout the world right now of the Muslim faith. There are many people who are embracing it. One of the greatest mine, mining fields, if you will, where we're getting many converts uh, here in the United States are in American prisons where many of the, those who have been uh, incarcerated are being won over by those who are part of the Muslim faith even as I speak. There is a great movement taking place throughout this world, guys. We know this. We read our newspapers. We watch the news. And this movement is, is, is in its heart, in the in more fanatic elements, in the heart of those who are extreme are, are absolutely bent on the destruction of Israel. There's just no doubt about that. There's a great anger. When, whenever you go to Israel, uh, sometimes those whom we have spoken to, there are Muslims that we have encountered because, of course, when we go into Israel, it, it's, a, it's a, a nation that has a good-sized population of Muslims, and, and many of them have been very kind to us, and, 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 and many have not. Uh, there have been those who uh, have been very angry. I remember on one occasion, uh, one Muslim got angry because I wouldn't buy something from him. And, and with, with anger and venom, he looked at me and he says, you love the Jews. And I found what an interesting thing to say. It was, it was a, a, it's like he was swearing at me when he said it. You love the Jews. And I smiled at him. I didn't want to say anything. Well, of course we do. But you want to know what the Lord spoke to my heart at that time when he said, you love the Jews? I looked at him, and the Lord spoke to my heart, and I'm repeating it to you uh, because uh, I have to. Um, he said, uh, that's true, you do love the Jews, but do you love him? But do you love him? Because my immediate response was, well, of course I love Israel because God has called me to. But God hasn't called me just to love Israel. God has called me to love people. And when that man said that to me, I have to tell you, I've never forgotten. It's probably been about 15, 20 years ago, but I've never forgotten. So when I speak about this, I believe that the scripture is very clear in stating that this is a coalition of, of Islamists. There's no doubt about that. The, the countries that we're looking at that God is speaking about, all of them represent um, countries with a large Muslim population. Is it possible for this to take place? I believe so. Is there a movement in, in, in this direction for an invasion, even as I speak? You know, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, will they use the nuclear weapons? Absolutely. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. Is it a possibility for um, a preemptive strike to come from the nation of Israel? Under this government, yes, there's no doubt about that. Is this something that's gonna take place in the near future? I suspect that it is. Now, if it is going to take place in the near future, what about us, the church? I believe very strongly in an event called the rapture. On the prophetic calendar of God, the next event on his prophetic calendar is the rapture. I strongly believe that what's going to happen is the rapture is going to occur. It's going to occur soon. I pray that, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if it occurs now? I mean, I, I want that rapture to happen. I want to go to be with the Lord. I look forward to being with him. I do believe that it's going to take place. I pray that it's in my lifetime. And, uh, and, and I should live that way. You know, my pastor Chuck Smith's 82 years old, 
And he stays in it. He keeps on preaching. I mean, you can't get him out of that pulpit even after having those minor strokes. He wants to be in the pulpit. Do you know that Pastor Chuck actually believes that the rapture is going to happen in his lifetime? And, and that's one of the things that drives him to be in the pulpit. And he wants to be raptured when he's preaching the Word of God. What an incredible testimony to me. He, he, he truly does. He truly believes that the Lord is coming in his lifetime. Now, did he, has he ever set a date? No, he hasn't. Do I set dates? No, I don't. But do we live in anticipation? Absolutely. Is there anything stopping the Lord Jesus Christ from coming today? Only God knows. Should we be ready? Absolutely. Absolutely. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up and taken to be with him. And therefore, we need to live as if we're awaiting that moment to take place. When it does, and the Antichrist ascends into his position, strikes a covenantal agreement with the nation of Israel, sometime in that period, Israel will be invaded by a coalition bent on destroying them, pillaging them. But God says, when they come against you, I will defend you. Though the nations will not, I will. And I've discovered that when God is on your side, who can be against you? And so this is a word of comfort to the nation of Israel. There's a, 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 a near future event in that they are going to return from Babylonian exile, but there's a distant event when they have come to dwell peacefully in the land that, that a coalition will come against them, but God will rise up in their defense and will destroy their enemies because God is good to his word.